Bible study for everybody met the 5th of February, and uh, I reminded everyone that uh, Max McLean, or the fellow whose DVD I have who memorized the book of Mark and, and uh, plays it, uh, recites it, uh, is going to be uh, directing and performing in screw tape, which is uh, an adaption of the screw tape letters written by C.S. Lewis down at the University of Texas uh, on the 16th of this month. We, we had a moment of review last week. We talked about prayer, and we talked about prayer in a number of ways. What is prayer? Uh, conversation with God. I covered all this in the summary last week. Why pray? There are myriad reasons to pray, not the least of which is we're commanded to pray. The Bible tells us to pray. Uh, what to pray about? Um, just about anything, uh, so long as it's in accordance with God's will. What is the object of prayer? I think there are two objects of prayer. One is to bring our will into alignment with God's will. If God is perfect, uh, we certainly are not. And aligning our will with God's will is one primary objective of prayer. Another primary objective of prayer is to bring glory to God. How to pray? The Bible doesn't give a format for prayer. It gives an example in the Lord's Prayer of a, of a structure for prayer. And there are many other prayers in the Bible that you can look at for examples, but the Bible doesn't dictate um, that you have to stand up or sit down or kneel down or fold your hands or bow your heads or whatever. Um, then we looked forward to uh, what we were going to do last night, which was uh, we listened to Mac, Max McLean talk about uh, the first uh, recite, perform is the word I want, the first 13 verses of the sixth chapter of Mark. And we then uh, discussed those uh, two instances that are illustrated in those forms. The first was when Jesus was rejected in his hometown of Nazareth, and the second was when he sent the 12 out. And um, he did send them out, and he commissioned them to go, and uh, uh, he gave them power over unclean spirits. Um, and they went out and preached that people should repent. They cast out many demons. They anointed with oil many who were sick, and they healed them. Um, that led us to a little discussion of, as believers, what's our commission? And we read Matthew 28, 18 through 20, which I'll read here. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. In the first chapter of Acts, verse 8, we read where Jesus says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. We then talked a little bit about what our reactions to that commission are and how it affects us. Um, interesting statement was made by someone when, they, when he said, I think the Great Commission... Um, terrifies most Christians. And so we had then a discussion of uh, some, I, I gave them some examples that I knew of, of on a very local kind of basis. Um, one was a, an example that I heard a pastor talking about at a conference one time. He had a um, elderly gentleman in his congregation who somehow decided he was uh, concerned or had on his heart the young people in the local college and so he would take his Bible and go out and sit in the cafeteria or the student union every day for a couple hours at the same time 
and uh, he would read his Bible and pray that uh, Christ would use him in some way. And sure enough, of course, eventually some student said, hi, I see you're here all the time. What are you doing? And he said, well, I'm here reading my Bible and praying that uh, God would use me somehow or that I could be useful. How are you doing? And the upshot was, of course, that over time, many students would sit down and chat with this guy, and he would have lots of opportunities to talk to them. Another story that I knew of was of a uh, very small, dying, actually, uh, inner city church somewhere. I can't remember where it was. And the Maybe they had 12 people left in the church, and they were all elderly, and they could see that they were just dying, and they were trying to decide if they could do anything about it. Uh, and they thought that they needed somehow to reach young people. So three of them decided and went to the local high school, which was just a block down the street, and asked the principal if they could um, come to the next assembly. And um, what they wanted to do was tell the student body that they had this little church up there and these older people in it and they had a lot of life experience and if anybody wanted to talk to somebody or needed somebody to listen to them, uh, they'd be more than happy to do that. So the principal, of course, said, well, you can't, you know, you can't be up there Bible thumping or passing out tracts or anything like that, but sure, you can do that. So they did. In the assembly, they get up in front of all these hundreds of students <laughs> and they stammer and stutter around, but and eventually they tell them, you know, we got a lot of people up there, a dozen of us or so, lots of life experience. We'd be happy to talk with you or listen to you um, if that would be of any interest to you. And, and they really felt awkward, and finally they gave up the phone number at the church, and they, and they left. And all the way back up the block to the church, they're kicking themselves about how stupid they sounded and how dumb that must have been. And they just can't get over that they ever thought anything like that would uh, have any effect at all. And when they walked into church, the phone was already ringing off the hook. Um, and the third story that I shared was of a uh, pastor in a local, in a little Texas town who, who got a call from the chief of police. And the uh, chief of police said, you know, I'd like to get some people together and go out and do some prayer walking at the high school just walk through the halls and pray for the high school and for these kids. And so they did that a number of times. And of course, the kids uh, would see their own pastor in this group and uh, say, hey, what are you doing here? And he'd say, well, we're just here praying for you and praying for this school. So there are ways to do things on a very local basis. Uh, the United States is the largest English-speaking missionary field in the world. And we don't have to learn Swahili and go somewhere, but we have to go out and we have to step out in faith. Uh, and I ask this breakout groups to pray, uh, put on their prayer list, uh, how could they, we individually, collectively, somehow uh, begin to be more proactively witnessing for our faith? and for what Jesus has done for us. And we've learned from the few verses that we studied where he sent out the 12 that uh, they worked together, they went out in twos, they were told not to force the message. In fact, they were told if anybody didn't receive them to shake the dust off their feet and move on. Uh, they were told not to take a bunch of stuff, they were to trust in God's provision and Jesus enables those he sends out. So that was the lesson. And they had some time in the breakout prayer groups. As I mentioned, next week we are going to cover Mark chapter 6, verses 14 to 56. I've posted that worksheet on the website for those eager beavers and folks who want to uh, take a look at it or work on it and, and bring it along with them. God bless you. We'll see you next week.